Thank you. Hi, my name is Alexey. I'm working in Avalogix company. We are producing company uh, underwater acoustic equipment for communication and positioning. And uh, my talk about the very specific uh, for this conference uh, problem domain, the uh, networking underwater. And yeah, the first question I hear when I uh, tell about it is, it, is it something about uh, communication between U-Bots? No, it's not. <laughs> uh, if we will take a closer look, we will find uh, much more stuff there underwater, which is interesting and uh, not necessarily connected to militaries. And uh, I will start my talk more uh, about the applications to have uh, for you to give an understanding uh, what is the application field for what I am talking about, what are potentially the problems, the uh, restrictions, and after that I will uh, come to the um, place where Erlang uh, plays its, its role. You know, it's, it's our planet. For some reason, it's called Earth, but the Earth itself, it's, it's only 29% of the surface, and th the rest is water. And interesting is that uh, nowadays we know quite good uh, the we have the maps of, of the Moon, the maps of Mars, which is uh, much better than the, the maps of our own planet, at least its underwater part. And and uh, th this field is, is great and unexplored, and uh, my talk is, is about the small aspect of uh, this problem, is how to exchange data underwater and maybe how to, to uh, do positioning underwater. Uh, it's also not always obvious, um, so why we cannot use radio waves underwater? Because the, the propagation uh, is, is very limited there. So we can treat the uh, radio waves, uh, waves only for as a, as a mean for near field communication. For example, if you have some uh, gadgets on the diver, they can use radio communication to, to exchange data between, between some, some gadgets uh, mounted on the, on the body. But uh, if you're talking about communication on more essential uh, ranges, uh, it doesn't work. And we don't have GPS underwater. So basically, we cannot use radio there. Uh, optical waves, yes, we can use it on a bigger distance if the water is clean. And uh, practically, uh, yeah, there are systems um, promising that uh, you can always get a range up to 100 meters, but it's also quite limiting. And um, th the rest is, is it's, it's only acoustics. Uh, with acoustics, depending on the frequency range for a practical applications, you can get up to 10 kilometers. Uh, for uh, the frequencies more than 10 kilohertz. If you go deeper, you can get even a larger uh, range, but from the practical point of view, 10 kilometers is just, is just fine. And uh, we can also use um, the acoustic waves not only for data transmission, we can use the same signals also to estimate uh, the uh, position of uh, the remote node, uh, which is uh, also very interesting task and important task. Sometimes even uh, communication aspect is it's not important, but only the positioning pl plays a role. For example, if you are talking about uh, the uh, remotely operated vehicle hanging on a cable from the ship, you have a communication link, but you still don't know where the ROV is and the way to find or to estimate its position is to use acoustics. Uh, but we have a lot of limitations in acoustic channel. Uh, the one of the very essential limitation I is is uh, the sound speed. It's it's five order of magnitude slower than the radio waves on light speed speed of light, and it means that if we have a remote node on a distance of uh, 1.2 kilometers, we send a packet. We would like to get an acknowledgement. We need to wait two seconds. So. In the case where we use radio, we don't care about uh, these delays, but uh, in, the, in this case, it plays a big role. And uh, the uh, frequency range is highly limited, so we can speak about uh, 10 tens of kilohertz available. 
It means also just uh, in the end we have a few kilobit per second uh, bit rate, available bit rate, maybe tens of uh, kilobit per second depending on the frequency range and, and application. But uh, having uh, this range, just just imagine uh, we, we are we are typically using megabits, uh, gigabits. We forget about what kilobit is. Just maybe find find your old-fashioned modem uh, you used maybe in 80s or 90s and try to use it today to connect to the internet and to find uh, to, to open the simplest page. You will get this feeling. <laughs> And yeah, so having this frequency range, uh, we cannot also use uh, many approaches which allow um, multiple access from several users, like a CDMA approach. It's, it's some suppliers say they use it, uh, but uh, with a very limited number of users, maybe four, maybe eight best, and uh, the, the efficiency uh, bit per joule efficiency in this case would be not necessarily good. And we cannot also uh, transmit and receive data at the same time. So, so this, uh, the, the properties also, if we, sh if we speak about uh, communication with a moving object in the shallow water, is it's a nightmare because the uh, multipass is, is changing too fast. And um, uh, it means that we, we need to adapt to this multipass and to find the, the best uh, possible bitrate to, to um, send data. So all these factors are plays a big role and um, at the end, if we go higher, if we solve some of these problems on the physical layer, sti still on the data link layer, we have very uh, limiting factors. The propagation delay uh, is not neg negligible in the, uh, with acoustics. So it's, it, does it do differs from the wireless radio, and in wireless radio we think about uh, megahertz or gigahertz. In acoustics we need to uh, use what we have, just uh, tens of kilohertz. Uh, about positioning, uh, so there are several approaches for positioning. So basically for positioning we use the same device, acoustic modem, where we can um, out of box get also a range and having a range from different points uh, you can use a multi-lateration approach to estimate the position so this is so-called long baseline approach and um, if you have you uh, use also so-called ultra short baseline antenna the small one uh, you can also measure having just a one signal measure range and uh, the bearing and elevation angles to estimate the position. But uh, the thing is that if you use uh, the channel for positioning, uh, it restricts also you in uh, the sense of using it for communication. So more interesting is to think about the protocols that can combine the both tasks. For example, if you have uh, some uh, formation of autonomous underwater vehicles moving uh, underwater, uh, you would like to have control over this formation and uh, you would like to have a position. So uh, there are uh, some interesting approaches to uh, combine this task, so-called co cooperative localization approaches. And uh, what, what I mean under acoustic modems, because uh, different uh, suppliers mean uh, different things. One should think, well, acoustic modem is just something doing modulation, demodulation detection. So it's basically just a physical layer with a transducer and analog part. Uh, we treat the acoustic modem as a more uh, a sophisticated device. We have there uh, the analog part, transducer with the receive transmitter uh, amplifier. We have there uh, three types of processors. It's a DSP and FP FPGA processor for the physical layer and ARM processor for a data link layer. And you can use it, so we have ARM Linux running there. Uh, you can run also your own software, which could be just uh, something uh, integrating the modem with external sensors, or it can be the uh, networking stack uh, solving some networking task, like Evans in this case. So we can run Evans inside the modem on the same platform. Uh, you can have also optional ultra short baseline antenna to, to estimate the angles if you need it. So on the physical layer, 
we solve more or less classical task, uh, the modulation, particle detection, and demodulation. We need also to estimate uh, the multipass, this change in multipass uh, structure in the channel in order to adapt to it. And we do also some uh, estimation of time differences of arrivals in the ultra short baseline antenna grid. Uh, on the, on the uh, data link layer, uh, we have uh, two approaches. We have combined them in one protocol. Uh, the first approach is optimized for data transmission point to point between two modems, where we try to find the best optimal bit rate for data transmission. Uh, the short term media access algorithm is basically for transmission of instant messages. In which is good for networking, where we don't need to adapt to the channel, we just choose the parameters which are well enough in most cases. And uh, this is also good for positioning. And uh, how it looks like? So this is one of uh, the type of the application. We have some nodes placed on the C button with some sensors like uh, pressure measurement, like seismic sensors, like uh, uh, current meter, etc. And uh, we, we would like to get uh, the data online if we have a surface buoy or just on occasions if we come with a boat to the site, we can download the data. So these are more or less typical approaches for data transmission. Uh, we see bottom observatories. You see this picture. Oh, sorry, it's it's too early, but this one. It's the modem used for low frequency modem for high range used for or developed for a tsunami early warning system for Indonesian system. And uh, this one, uh, yeah, it's used here on the Baltic uh, Sea in order to measure uh, the, the current profile and uh, transmit data, this is the modem, yeah? transmits data from uh, the station to the buoy and then via a uh, satellite link to the, to the shore. Yeah, and uh, this one uh, shows you how it looks like uh, after you will recover it. This nice picture, this is the modem after three months of use uh, in the Mediterranean area on a relatively small depth, it's still functional, yeah, but if you, if you keep it longer, at some point it will not work properly. So the other picture, it's also quite nice. It, it's it's uh, the modem was used uh, on the surface of Atlantic Ocean uh, for the uh, data extraction from the observatory close to uh, Black Smoker Lucky Strike. And uh, it's it's very interesting area for for geophysicists for oceanographers, but y y you see what happens. Yeah? So this is a very aggressive um, media there, and it's also a limiting factor for the uh, duration of uh, the deployment. Uh, this is another, uh, let's say, typical uh, case. It's a positioning of uh, underwater autonomous vehicle, AUV, uh, during some operation. So typically we have some vessel launching the vehicle and uh, the vehicle is doing some operation, but you would like also to, to have a control over it and to, to track what happens underwater to get a status uh, via acoustic link and to estimate the position. In, in the more interesting cases, you can have a couple uh, vehicles doing some uh, something together. And in, in this case, uh, the, the networking is starting to play a big role that because y you would like not to lose control over each of the vehicle and to, to see what happens on all of them and uh, to avoid possible collisions. It's, it's expensive to have collisions yeah? here. And uh, yeah, this is a picture just showing how it looks like. This is a special design of uh, ultra short baseline antenna optimized for, for the vehicle uh, to have the smaller drag. Um, then, yeah, this is uh, another case. This is a long baseline positioning. So what happens here, we place some nodes on the bottom 
then calibrate the system in order to define the geographical position of the LBL nodes, and then you can put some equipment there in no and uh, run the antenna in order to, to track uh, most accurately the, the positions of the AUV or remotely operated vehicle, uh, and yeah, just to, to have a feeling what is the size of the unit. We have this nice picture here. And th this is the other picture. It's it's a, a diver zone uh, for also for LBL positioning. So if you would like to to measure some fixed points underwater, you can you can place the zone, and then uh, using the LBL antenna, you can uh, estimate the position. So this is more or less about uh, ah, it's another very interesting application. Yeah. Yeah, so the precision, I in the case of uh, ultra short baseline antenna, USBL, uh, we measure uh, the, the precision in angles, let's say. So it depends then on the range. Uh, then we have like uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.2 uh, degrees. The question was about uh, the precision. Yeah? And uh, in the case of long baseline antenna, we can say already some something about uh, uh, centimeters, tens, let's say tens of centimeters. It depends highly on the on the uh, application, on the variability of the channel itself, because if you calibrate it with some sound velocity profile, it may change during a day, and then it will affect the result. So, but you can you can think about uh, tens of centimeters in this case. So I can imagine uh, if the as it goes through thermal layers, that would affect uh, the accuracy. If the thermal layers themselves, you change. can you can measure you can measure uh, the sound velocity profile and use it for the estimation. But the problem is the variability. So if if the profile will change during the day, which happens in some areas, it mm -hmm. will affect the accuracy marking. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, this is a very uh, specific uh, case. This is a Baikal neutrino telescope. So the problem is that the neutrino is a small particle, which is um, yeah, hardly to detect. And one of the uh, way to detect it, it it's uh, uh, detected through the uh, Cherenkov radiation. But the problem is that uh, in order to differentiate it from the other sources of light, you need to uh, exclude all other sources of light. So you need to go very deep underwater. You need to have a good depth and good transparency there. And in this case, you can say, okay, if you detect something, it's a Chernyankov radiation, and um, uh, the, the, the system itself is a huge, so the, it consists of a, of a big number of uh, photomultipliers, so it's a, it's a huge antenna, and uh, the problem is it, it's moving. So if you even detect the Chernyankov uh, radiation, you would like also to find some parameters, uh, the, the direction, and uh, in this case, you need also to have some estimation about the position of the photomultipliers during the event happened. And yeah, so yeah, <laughs> so you need to you need to use acoustics in this case as well. Yeah? It, it's how it looks like. So it's just baseline modem there. And uh, this is uh, just a standard sphere used also both for photomultipliers or and for, for the rest uh, electronics there. It's basically just housing. Um, yeah, so this is about the application. Then, uh, yeah, this is uh, the, the not uh, the first try to, to build a framework for networking underwater. There are um, some existing. The first one is uh, based on the uh, GNU radio platform with a tiny OS, uh, which is uh, hardly yeah, connected to, to, to the hardware, so it's, it's not easy to, to re-implement it on the other platform. Uh, the other two, Sunset and uh, Desert, uh, yeah, well developed platform based on uh, NS2 uh, simulator. So this is quite well known networking simulator. Uh, they adapted it to use it in, in real life. Uh, the problem with it is that you have quite a big threshold before you start to do something on based on these frameworks. And uh, UNET stack, it's, it's a, yeah, a GVM based framework. Uh, the, the this uh, free sunset desert unit stack also compatible. You can basically run it inside our modem, but uh, we decided for our own projects uh, to develop something uh, different because uh, yeah, it was not really easy to to go in 
with, with this framework. This was one of the reason. Another reason, yeah, we, we, are, we are looking what would be the, the base uh, for, for this uh, new framework. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have decided to use uh, Erlang language just to specify uh, about which layer we are talking about. It's, it's not a physical layer. We have also uh, this uh, DMAC protocol implementing uh, the, the basic data link layer and uh, the Erlang plays a role on, on top of it. So basically, if you, if you do the integration with sensors or you build your own networking protocol, we have started to use Erlang to solve these tasks. And uh, what are the challenges uh, underwater? So equipment is, is uh, expensive. Even more expensive is to test it because in order to test it in real under realistic condition, you need a vessel to transport it somewhere and uh, the vessel cost per day, it's, it's about it, it tens of thousand euro a day. So you think that developer will ask manager, well, I need to test it next week. Well, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, the, the practical use of the system is also very expensive. So I it's, um, uh, as I said, just if, if everything is ready, or you hope it's ready, you, you place it underwater. Uh, it's, a, it's a very expensive uh, operation, and if it's already deployed and you will find out that something went wrong, maybe you will not be able to recover it uh, till the next year. So you need to be very uh, careful here. Uh, then, of course, uh, all tasks are very specific. Uh, there are no standards in sensors. Uh, the requirements are very different depending on the task. I have shown you just some of the cases and there are, there are no typical applications basically here and sometimes we need to do development from scratch. Uh, when we integrate it with a new sensor or uh, yeah, adapt it to, to some specific area. So basically, developer gets a task, gets a, some time limitation, no hardware, because hardware maybe it's already ordered, but not yet delivered. After it's delivered, even if you have, for example, the modems, you can try to play with them in a pool. And you can uh, try your protocols running on top of it with a pool. But the problem is uh, that if you will place it on a bigger distance, the propagation delay will be much bigger and it will maybe break your software. So basically, with the hardware, it's, it's a bad story to try it. And yeah, in the end, you have not enough time to test the system. So realistically, as always, so yeah, we, we know we have some bugs there and uh, we still need to solve our task. And it sounds like uh, uh, Erlang uh, knows the problem and it was designed also to uh, solve the problem that when we have uh, bugs existing, but we still have some fault tolerant system still running. So I've just, uh, yeah, have here the known list from the Joy's thesis. And if, if you have a closer look, you'll find that uh, these, these uh, features which we have got in Erlang, they are very well related. So the, the, the uh, first three, obviously, highly important for fault tolerance. Uh, if you speak about a system which should run a year or two underwater, software uh, real time is it's very nice if, if you need to do uh, to implement the positioning algorithms uh, because uh, yeah we need to define exactly the time when the signal should be transmitted and it also yeah has some restriction on the real time. Uh, processes. The hardware interaction, it, it's not uh, so easy in Erlang because you basically need to put the very specific hardware specific parts in the ports. But from the other side, you have just awesome uh, binary syntax to parse the data when you get it, which is just great. Uh, and yeah, the, the size of the system is, is, is it's growing. So we need to think that in future we will have uh, much more complex system in the comparison to uh, today. And uh, we can also dream about the possibility to do some, possibly some updates uh, through acoustic link, uh, having the continuous operation of the system. So it's, it's uh, some way to go, but maybe 
it will work. And Erlang basically has it. So based on this solution, we can maybe adapt it to uh, the reality here. So uh, yeah, the, this is the basic diagram showing the components. So in order to do the development, you need either uh, the physical modem or you can use a modem emulator, which we provide to uh, uh, our customers and to uh, the people who would like to, to play around with it. Uh, then you can run yeah, for testing Erlang where you just prefer, or you can, in the, in the uh, real system, you can have Erlang running inside the modem. And the we have some uh, components solving uh, the, uh, yeah, the tasks like uh, the Mac layer uh, protocol implementation, the routing protocol implementation, or uh, yeah, other parts. And we have a special component called, uh, called Watcher, which is just analyzing the configuration and preparing the system and uh, to, to run the modules um, in the framework. And so how much time? Yeah, 15 minutes, okay. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, the supervision tree. Basically, the, the, the core of the system, I it's here. Yeah, so it's uh, some implementation of uh, uh, FSM behavior. Uh, so we define here explicitly uh, the uh, finish state machine or uh, push down air automator, if you prefer it. Uh, then you define the uh, handlers for each uh, state and uh, you define the, uh, you pre-process the, the messages you get from uh, the uh, yeah, outside. Uh, and so the, the core logic should be implemented here. Then we have a role worker. A role worker can be uh, treated as a, a middleman. So it's a middleman between the interface, some external interface, and uh, the, the uh, core uh, module. So we have, for, for example, the uh, middleman called AT for interaction to uh, the acoustic modem. Then we have an NMEA middleman to parse uh, the enemy messages used for uh, navigation purposes uh, and uh, yeah, other middlemen to talk to higher or lower layer protocols. And we have FSM worker, which is also configuring the, the FSM before starting it. And yeah, we can run a number of, of modules uh, at the same time. Uh, then how we connect uh, the modules to each other. So we have uh, four types for it. It can be a TCP IP socket uh, as a connection type. And uh, at the end of these uh, errors, we have these uh, middleman to, to convert it from the external interface to the uh, terms, which uh, can be understood or tuples. Uh, then we have uh, the um, middleman for uh, ports uh, to, um, yeah, to talk to external applications. Uh, this is uh, just a shortcut to use uh, the uh, standard message passing mechanism of Erlang. And we have uh, the special type uh, of the uh, middleman to integrate it with a uh, cowboy. So for the case, if you uh, have an operator uh, using some system, we can embed also a web application inside the modem and then the clicks are then um, converted to the events for, uh, for the module. So for, for the case of, uh, for example, the problem is that uh, in many cases, we need also to use a serial interface and serial interface is not supported out of box, so we need to put it outside uh, the uh, analog as an as a external application. Yeah, so in order to, if you would like to um, create your new module, you need to follow these steps. You need to create uh, the uh, FSM behavior implementation. 
uh, you need to create an FSM worker implementation, then you need to define explicitly the finished state machine or push down automata, and then have a converter from uh, the middleman uh, tuples to uh, the events. So basically the idea is that you take your favorite uh, tool to sketch uh, the state machine. My tool is pen and uh, piece of paper just to, to think about the algorithm on the level of abstraction you prefer or you feel is good. You define the events, you define the states, and uh, then when you are happy with uh, the results, you can try uh, out your first implementation. So you just convert this picture to, to this uh, list. So basically, of course, this step can be optimized if you prefer. S E send phase. So <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, you can just directly connect uh, convert it to the to the representation in the form of list with states and errors. And then you need to define for, for, for each uh, state, you need to define a handler. And yeah, then you create a configuration where you define which middlemans uh, you would like to use. In this case, uh, yeah, so what I'm talking about is CSMA Aloha, sorry. This is uh, the very basic uh, media access algorithm, uh, a, a bit uh, modified version of the well-known Aloha uh, pro access protocol. This is carrier sense media access Aloha. And uh, yeah, we uh, do with this uh, with this uh, uh, module, we do the um, slightly uh, the modification of the behavior of standard MAC protocol to the CSMA Aloha protocol. So on on one side, on downside, we have uh, the connection to the acoustic modem, and for the um, higher uh, layers, we have another role, which is uh, basically used to connect your high-level applications. Uh, then, yeah, this is how it looks uh, like this event preprocessor. So we just need to modify here the status of the uh, state machine, SM, so we can um, int return it modified. In this case, we can uh, also uh, generate an event and ask uh, to run the corresponding uh, handler. So we don't know what the handler should be uh, uh, run because it depends on the current uh, state of the state machine. So we ask it through the run event to run the, um, to react on the, on the, on the event. Or you can uh, just, in this case, we do not uh, handle it uh, directly. We just simply uh, cast some message on the, on the middleman. So this is more or less how it looks like. Uh, this preprocession, and then, uh, yeah, as soon as we have uh, free handler, uh, free states, we need to implement free handlers. I have here an just example of the implementation of one of the handler, which ex uh, actually the the back off state where when we have found uh, found that the signal was transmitted, we are in back off, and uh, if timeout happens, and we have a request to send data. We will just find out that no, it's it's still back off. We need to update the timeout. Uh, so this is what, what happens basically here. Uh, then, yeah, I'm coming to the uh, final notes. So if, uh, the the project uh, is uh, yeah released under dual license BSD and uh, GPL. Uh, the status of the project is it's quite early, so we can already start to use it for internal projects, but uh, for uh, the curious uh, developers, yeah, if, if you're brave enough, you can try. If it will fail, you may ask, uh, so you are very welcome to, to join. Uh, for, yeah, for as an acoustic modem supplier, we also keep the door open. And we also hope to do some kind of uh, unification of uh, the protocols we implement, so what will be will make things easier to uh, to to 
configure the system and to prepare it for real life applications. It's uh, the, the most crucial yeah, next step for us. So thank you for your attention and questions. How many of these systems do you have deployed in the ocean currently? And uh, we basically we sell uh, these systems. We don't deploy them, uh, but yeah, we have already hundreds of systems uh, installed. So it's it's quite a essential num number for this uh, problem domain, let's say, and uh, yeah, it's the answer. Is there a, any problem that you can have competing systems on the underground, on the water? I, I could imagine that you have other sources of sound that kind of uh, interacts, or, or, or are you saying, okay, in this area, this, uh, this frequency band is free for these uh, acoustic mm -hmm. modems? Or well, typically, typically it's not a problem. <laughs> but yes, the, the if you have uh, the noise in the same frequency band, it may affect the uh, system. Uh, there is a question there. I'm sorry. Yeah, microphone. Yeah. So can you speak a little bit about the power uh, um, power output for these things and uh, interference with the uh, wildlife? Uh, power. So, uh, for example, uh, for the system placed uh, close to this uh, black smoker, we have a couple of uh, kilometers depth, and uh, I think, uh, so minimally you need to, uh, on the lowest source level, it takes about uh, 3 watt in transmission. I think they use like 20 watt in transmission, uh, which uh, yeah allows them to use the system a year to transmit data they uh, require. It includes some pictures and includes some data from sensors. Uh, about uh, the uh, yeah, reaction of, of uh, at least dolphins, yeah. So we have uh, tried the system next to uh, the oceanarium, for example, and uh, the reaction of, uh, of uh, the uh, mammals, it was not uh, like a stress, it was at the beginning, uh, curiosity, and then they just ignored, ignored uh, the presence of this activity. So uh, the the on on the quite essential distance, the source level uh, is not that high, uh, or the the receiving uh, signal level is not that high. So it will not essentially affect uh, the mammals, and I don't think it's a big issue for fishes. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just sort of... Uh, so do yeah, you it's, it's also quite frequent, the question, yeah. Right. But so well, uh, now how many dB are you actually putting out? At the, what, what's the... Uh, the source level, frequency? it's it's about... Uh, yeah, depends on model and um, other parameters, but it can be uh, like uh, 190 dB. Within uh, uh, what distance? Uh, one meter. One meter, okay. Yeah. So they'd want to stay away from that. Uh, what's the <laughs> frequency range? Frequency range, uh, typically, uh, yeah, for practical applications, we have three ranges. One is uh, 7 to 17 kilohertz, so you can hear it, this activity, for like 8 kilometers maximum. Uh, then the middle frequency range, in our case, it's 18 to 34 kilohertz, so you can slightly still hear something. Uh, but it's for like 3 kilometers, yeah, in bad channel or complicated channel, it's maybe 1 kilometer. And then high frequency, uh, yeah, it can be uh, 40 to 80 kilohertz or even higher, but it restricts essentially the, the range to a kilometer or to a couple of hundred meters. So it depends on the application, essentially. Uh, and then, did, uh, so have you spoken a little bit about the sort of general hardware um, sort of footprint that you're looking to design against? So memory size, power, that type mm. of stuff? You feel constrained in that area? Or no. Uh, also, uh, f it was I it was just uh, not a problem to first to cross compile the Erlang itself for our platform. It took 
couple of hours to, to find out the way to do it. And then, uh, yeah, the time to run it, uh, it takes maybe two seconds, but it's acceptable. So if, if it's run, it's run, it's running. Uh, memory consumption is, is also, so we have uh, the platform with uh, 64 megabytes uh, RAM. So it's fairly enough to solve uh, the tasks we have. So I don't feel uh, restricted in, in this case. Yeah. Okay, we have time for one more question. Right. So uh, thanks for the talk this morning. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs>